Thank you very much. Um, my name is John Looney. I'm a production engineer for Facebook in Dublin. Uh, I'm on the host provisioning team, so we get operating systems onto servers and switches. Um, and us production engineers are very strange people, uh, very similar to, to SREs. I can't really tell the difference. But um, usually we help a development team with things like scalability, uh, reliability, um, other abilities, um, uh, enhanced abilities, I, I can't really remember. But the whole point is we take a much broader view of production and complement a development team uh, in many, many different ways. The Dublin office is a bit strange in that we don't actually have any development teams. Uh, we just took about 100 uh, production engineers and said, can you make the data centers better? So we do a mixture of development um, and, and operations, everything that keeps data centers going from uh, manufacturing quality in stuff coming out of factories to, uh, I suppose, decom of data center kit five or six years later when it's been binned. So, uh, how does this work? Yay. Okay, so in the case of my team, uh, we get operating systems onto servers. Ideally, when somebody energizes a rack uh, of equipment, it automatically notices uh, it, the network provisioning team, or one of our sister teams, their software notices that the rack is suddenly being powered on. They'll come in, set up the switch, and hand it over to us. Then we get operating systems on all of the machines in, in the rack, make sure they're all configured, tie a little bow around them, and hand them off to their eventual uh, machine owners. So this seems reasonably simple. But it turns out lots can go wrong. In the real world, um, provisioning is horrible. We are basically the lint trap in the washing machine. Everything that somebody can break anywhere through bad hardware, bad firmware, bad software, dumb software pushes, um, someone uh, tipped over a rack in the data center, bashed all the machines and went, I'm sure it's fine, and pushed it vertically. And then suddenly we've got a spew of weird hardware problems we've never seen before. That becomes our problem because we can't in install and uh, sign off on the machines. So we uh, do an awful lot of work on spotting hardware problems. We spot software problems. We have a really cool continuous integration system now where if anyone changes anything like new kernels, new firmware images or whatever, we deploy that kernel, that firmware on a few hundred machines, verify it's cool before allowing them to land that in production. So most things are pretty good, except, well, firmware is terrible. Um, that's one of the last things we, we, we can't fix. Now, hold on, I'm not complaining, right? Fixing all of these problems, finding all of these problems, finding long-term solutions for them, noticing that, have you noticed every single new platform we've ever had has a different way of, um, I don't know, reporting memory errors? That's really great production engineering work because we have this broad view. We understand the challenges that the data center um, designers have, the architects, the people specifying new hardware, the factories, and what they can deliver and how they iterate. We understand all of that. So that's really, really cool. We love finding odd problems, um, find, writing the fixes, automating whole classes of weirdness out of existence. But this firmware thing, that was one problem we couldn't solve. And let me tell you why. UEFI is about 20 years old at this stage. It replaced the generation one firmware for PCs written in 83 or so. Was it 81, 83? A long time ago, but 98, Microsoft and Intel decided we need to start from scratch. We'll actually have a written specification for what the firmware is supposed to do. Um, it was a software written by hardware engineers. And it's, it's hard to tell is software written by hardware engineers worse than network engineers, but it's around the same. Um, so it's written, written by the same people who did Windows 98, around the same vintage, similar design. Uh, it's a 5,000 page specification. Well, technically 2,500 pages is ACPI and the other 500 or 2,500 pages is UEFI. It's been hacked on by literally thousands of people ever since. Many of these people didn't use revision control. Um, in some cases, you might have uh, a firmware vendor will have taken a source dump from Intel from say 2001, and they've made internal in-house changes every so often, and only fix bugs that people complain to them about and paid the money to fix them. It's a horrendous mess. And it doesn't work for everybody, it certainly doesn't work for me. So I'm gonna expand on what, it mean, what I mean by it doesn't work for me. Machines can take five months to net boot. Like, I'm serious. You look at the logs and it was just trying to net boot every 30 seconds for five months, and then one day it goes, bing, it worked. And you go, what the hell? 
We've no idea. Maybe you've got a new network card, you stick it in the machine and it works for the first 500 machines. And after that, it doesn't. And you contact the vendor and go, what's going on? Oh no, that never worked. It's like, it did work. Why doesn't it work? No one knows. Uh, we've had machines shipped to us that don't support IPv6. And the vendor goes, no, no, you, you can net boot it off IPv4 and then you know, use IPv6 later in Windows or whatever. And we're looking at them going, what network? No, we've got millions of machines. We don't use IPv4 in the data. I'll punch you in the face. But no, like the, the, the software itself is very limited. There's no standardization across this. Um, if you do find a bug, you report it to the vendor, you give them loads of money, and they'll give you a fix back like four months later. In the meantime, you have a decision to make. Do you, I don't know, manually install the machines? Do you, um, for the next four months, do you uh, throw them out? Do you just leave them idle? Or all of them? Why not? I don't know. Um, yeah, like this is about 17 million lines of code in UEFI. And at the end, you get to run TFTP and 1983 protocol, whatever, Commodore 64 vintage to download your operating system. It's nonsense. Does anyone know what this means? Because a UEFI firmware will just pop that out to you and go, there you go. It's the exact same thing an Intel PC did in 1983. That means no memory detected. That's, that's awesome. Uh, we, we can do better, right? So the solution, I, I think personally, is open system firmware. So this is firmware for um, not just Intel, it'll work on, on AMD, uh, ARM, and a bunch of other platforms. I don't know how well, but some people are porting it to them. But what's, at its core, it's designed and built by software people. So that means it's well-tested, it's repeatable, it's beautiful. Um, we do minimal hardware initialization code, so just turn up the memory, uh, turn on the, or initialize the CPU, get the memory up and going, and as soon as that works, kick off Linux kernel, right? Why do you want a Linux kernel? We want the um, most battle-hardened, well-tested software running as early as possible. It's the best way of putting it. The other part that it runs is uroot, which is a tiny Linux user space based in Go. Um, about six meg megs of flash, it's still pretty, pretty good for six meg OS. Um, this way, you can get into the Linux network drivers as soon as possible, same battle-tested drivers you've used in your data center and the likes. We've got the same uh, kernel everyone else has used. You can have the same uh, user space, and you can have way more tools as well. But Linux's job is purely to find an operating system to boot, whether over the network, over the uh, locally, and then execute that. It's not as easy as I'm painting it, though. Um, we do depend on silicon vendors. Um, hardware initialization is voodoo, like seriously voodoo, weird shit. It's like you just need to take these 900 different numbers, poke them into random PCI address spaces, and your machine magically work. That's something you leave to the silicon vendors like Intel or AMD or whoever, the people who built your CPU, they know how this works. You need to convince them to give you a little hardware initialization blob that you can make small. Um, one of the other big problems we have is that, especially on switches, uh, most flash chips are like 16 megs, 8 megs in some cases. Um, the difference between a 16 meg chip and a 32 meg chip on a $10,000 switch is 10 cents. So yeah, we, we need to, you lose half of your flash on Intel's magic, uh, so you've got eight megs left, two megs for Linux kernel, six megs for the user space. Yeah, it's hard to get a lot of Linux for eight megs, but we, we do manage it. So what do we got today? Uh, OCP mini, mini pack is a cool new switch. Does anyone know what OCP mini pack looks like? It's like that, it's pretty cool. It's like 16, 400 gig ports or 6,400 gig ports. So it's pretty badass. Um, yeah, and you can download the specifications, and if you're good at soldering, you can make up your own circuit boards, and uh, it's pretty cool. Anyway, the cool thing about, uh, uh, so Minipack, unlike the, you can get it with UEFI, or you can get it with uh, Linux Boot. Uh, Linux Boot, Core Boot will ship boot in seven seconds, not four or five minutes. Um, you can log into the, say something goes wrong. A friend of mine um, had a problem where it wouldn't net boot. He could go in on the console, boot the machine up, hit Control C to get a, a command prompt. Uh, so it doesn't boot into the bootloader. And he was able to, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, run a few commands, like the IP command, see what addresses are there, et cetera. And you find, oh, line card's missing. That's weird. Run D message. Oh, there it is. It tries to initialize line card failed. It's hardware problem done. It took 20 seconds instead of, you know, a few weeks to work out why the line card is broken and how it's broken, et cetera. Um, yeah, you can get a fix for anything in that's anything small in say 30 minutes in one case someone said hey we notice when we download over https 
because yeah, we don't do TFTP, we do proper authenticated HTTPS. Um, it was re it wouldn't retry, so people were saying maybe we should retry three times. And someone said, "Great idea! Clicky click. Here's new firmware image." Thirty minutes later, let's verify it. Yeah, everything works. Beautiful. It's not a three week turnaround as you'd usually expect if you had a network vendor with a, a fantastic support contract. Um, and also, anyone who knows Go can extend it. Like the code is there on the internet. Just go to github.com slash coreboot, github.com slash linuxboot. You can patch it, write your own extensions, um, submit them to the community. And when you build your firmware image for your hardware, you can choose what you want to spend your flash on. It's pretty cool. So, yeah. So, what are we going to do tomorrow? Um, I'd really like to be able to netboot over uh, BitTorrent. We have, I got HTTPS working a few weeks ago, but yeah, imagine being able to install a data center full of switches and servers over BitTorrent. It's going to be pretty badass. Um, we've, you know, if you've, many companies have a machine checker for trying to work out like what, what hardware is broken. Um, yeah, we should be able to run clients in firmware so you can interrogate the firmware. Uh, I know that you should have all of these pieces of hardware. Which ones can you detect? Which ones failed? Why do they fail? We want to get more data out of that. There's also a movement called firmware transparency, where you'll be able to download a blob for your switch, and there's going to be a little version uh, section in that. You can un have a look at the version. You'll be told the GitHub uh, repos and commit hashes that that firmware image was built from, and you can rebuild your firmware image from those commit hashes, and then verify that it's exactly the same byte for byte. It's going to be pretty badass. Um, there's also a thing called Plan 9 file system where you could connect remotely from your desktop to uh, a core boot booted machine or Linux boot booted machine. Uh, and basically any binary you can run in your machine locally, you can run on the re one remotely. Obviously there's authentication stuff to sort out, but uh, it would mean that if you have a, say a big application locally that does some extra testing like a security forensics kit, be no problem doing that. So I've got a very quick demo. I know I'm out of time, but I'm going to do it anyway because I'm bigger than most people here. Okay, so this is what it looks like. Ah! Oh! Hey, there we go. Okay, so this is booting it on a um, booting Linux boot on a what's the word for it? Um, VM. This is pretty much how fast it. See, there it is. Half a second to initialize. You could hit Control C here to get a Linux prompt, or leave it go, and it'll try and boot. So here we go, DHCPing. Oh no, DHCP doesn't work, and we don't know why it doesn't work. We'll just have to wait. What would you do in a normal UEFI-based firmware? We just stare at it and go, I wonder why it's broken. But this is different. We've had a new tool called Fix My Netboot, uh, and Fix My Netboot is uh, a little Go tool that tries to debug what the hell's gone wrong. Uh, so you can see here it's running checking for which devices are there, checking link speeds, everything else. And if everything works, um, fix it. Okay. I don't have time for questions, but I would love to answer anything you have later on over beer. Thank you.